before getting started, how many of you have heard of Zappos prior to, to this? And how many of you have actually shopped with us before? Wow, very cool. So normally when I do the survey to a random group of people, the ratio is actually about two to one women to men. And a lot of women I've asked, uh, or, or men that I ask, say they, they haven't personally shopped from us, but their wife or significant other has. And a lot of times it's the significant other buying for the guy. And uh, I was actually giving a tour in Las Vegas a, little, a few years ago to an executive from one of the major record labels. And we actually were based out of Las Vegas, so next time any of you are in Las Vegas, we we'll definitely recommend coming for a tour. It's actually a lot of fun. Uh, we'll pick you up from the airport in a Zappos shuttle, give you a tour, it takes about an hour, and then drop you off at your hotel afterwards. Uh, so anyways, we were doing this for an executive from one of the major record labels, and I happened to be giving the tour. And I asked him the exact same question, had he shopped from us before? And he said, no, he hadn't, but he suspects his wife has because these white boxes would show up on his doorstep and then they disappear and he didn't know what was going on. It was, uh, didn't know if she was buying them or exchanging them, returning them. And every time he asked his wife, she would just change the subject or refuse to answer him. And so, you know, giving the tour, downstairs is the merchandising area. And then we walk upstairs to our customer loyalty team, which is our name for our call center. And as we're walking through, like, I, I'm starting to explain stuff and then turn around and he's gone. And I'm like, what happened? And I find out that he actually went down one of the aisles and sat down next to one of our reps and forced her to pull up his wife's account. <laughs> and so, and he, as it turned out, uh, he discovered she had spent over $62,000 in her lifetime. So, yeah. Hopefully we weren't instrumental in any divorce proceedings. Uh, so, um, and then as was mentioned, I have a book that came out a few months ago called Delivering Happiness. And we're actually on this three month cross country uh, bus tour. We got this 50 foot bus and actually uh, we have some pictures to, to show you. We wrapped the bus, there's 10 of us on the bus and we're, we've gone through I think 10 cities so far. And, uh, and, and, we, and the inside, I don't think I have any inside pictures of the bus, but this is the Delivering Happiness book team, and it's actually its own mini startup. There's about 20 of us, and 10 of us are on the bus on any one, at any one point. So if you want to find out more information, just go to deliveringhappinessbus.com and also deliveringhappinessbook.com. There's fun videos and pictures and, and so on there. And, uh, and oh yeah, this is also a fun video to, to watch uh, if you have the time. And I'll make this presentation available so you can uh, check out the video later. But we're actually, the bus is in Miami right now, so I'll, I'll be meeting back up with the bus at the end of this week. But um, before getting into Zappos, I wanted to talk about what led me to Zappos. And the story actually begins in college uh, with pizza. I was running a pizza business on the ground floor of my dorm in, in college, and uh, with my roommate Sanjay, he and I decided to invest in pizza ovens. And it's this area that was set aside. We probably had three or four hundred students in our dorm. And the way it would work is every year there'd be a new set of students that would run that uh, grill. It was called the grill area downstairs. And so one year we had, we were the highest bidders and we bought it from the owners the, from the previous year. And we decided to invest in pizza ovens and we uh, hired other students, set the menus, dealt with uh, suppliers, and so on. And occasionally I was making the pizzas myself. And this guy named Alfred, who actually is the chief financial officer today at Zappos, he would stop by every night and order a large pepperoni pizza from me. And this is actually how we met. And to me, it actually wasn't that weird he was doing it because I had heard about his reputation and he was known to actually eat, a, really eat a lot of food. He had nicknames like uh, Monster or Human Trash Compactor. And you know, literally, there'd be nights when there'd be 10 of us late night at a Chinese restaurant and he would just eat, finish everyone's leftovers. So, you know, not that weird, but then sometimes a few hours later, he'd come by and order another large pepperoni pizza for me. And I was like, wow, this boy can really eat. Well, I found out several years later Alfred was taking the pizzas upstairs and selling them off by the slice. So <laughs> that's why he's our chief financial officer right, today. <laughs> so after the pizza business, uh, then Sanjay and I, who I was running the pizza business with, we got together and formed a company called Link Exchange. And this was during the first uh, you know, dot com craziness. And we grew that to about 100 or so people and then ended up selling the company to Microsoft two and a half years later. 
But what a lot of people don't know is the real reason why we ended up selling the company. And the real reason is because it just wasn't a fun place to work at anymore. And the company culture just went completely downhill. I remember when it was just five or 10 of us, it was your typical dot com. It was a lot of fun. We were working around the clock, sleeping under our desks, had no idea what day of the week it was, uh, trying to remind ourselves to shower occasionally, uh, but lots of fun. And as we were growing, we hired friends and friends of friends. And I remember there was a friend of mine that was on a cross country trip from New York. And uh, this was all out of our apartment here in uh, San Mateo at the time. And he stopped by to help out. And then uh, he actually never made his way back home. He ended up joining the company. And that worked really well until we got to about 20 people. Uh, it, we were having a lot of fun. And, and then we ran into a really big problem when we got to 20 people. And the problem was basically we ran out of friends. And so we're, we're trying to figure out, OK, what do we do now? We didn't know how to hire people. And so we started just figuring it out on our own. And we ended up hiring, actually, all the people with the right skill sets and experience, but they weren't all necessarily great for the company culture. And by the time we got to 100 people, I myself dreaded getting out of bed in the morning to go to the office. And that's kind of a weird feeling, because this was a company I co-founded. And I felt like, you know, if I felt that way, how must all the other employees feel? So that's really what led us to, to sell the company to Microsoft. And after the sale, myself, Sanjay, and most of the early employees, we all left the company shortly thereafter. So after that sale, it you know, worked out well financially, trying to figure out, OK, now what do, we want, what do I want to do with my life? And I'm the type of person that gets bored really easily and I'm always uh, excited by new ideas. And so Alfred and I got together, and we formed a fund and invest in about 20 or so different internet companies. And in my mind, I was like, wow, this is a great way to really just get exposed to a lot of different businesses and ideas and so on. And making the investments was actually pretty exciting and pretty fun. There was always some new idea, some new business. And you know, this was in the beginning of the internet days. Uh, but then after we had made all the investments and you know, there wasn't any money left to invest in the fund, I realized that at that point, uh, and for me at least, investing was pretty boring. I felt like I was sitting on the sidelines. And I really miss being part of building something. So I started thinking about what do I want to do. And out of all the companies we had invested in, Zappos happened to be one of them. And it was both the most exciting and the most promising. So basically, within a year, I joined Zappos full time. And I've been with Zappos ever since. Uh, some of you may have heard it was about a year ago that Amazon announced they were acquiring Zappos. And except it's actually very different from most acquisitions that Amazon has done in, in the past. In most of their acquisitions, the plan is to integrate the company being acquired into the parent company. And then eventually, the original company kind of loses its identity. And everything's integrated into the mothership and ab absorbed there. Whereas for us, as a precondition for even considering to explore the deal, we told them that we would only consider it if Zappos could remain independent if we could continue to grow our brand and our culture and our way of doing business our way. And the great news is they've remained true to their word. So from our point of view, it's just as if we swapped out our board of directors for a new one. So once a quarter, instead of flying to the Bay Area, we now fly to Seattle once a quarter for the equivalent of a board meeting. So most people, when they hear about Zappos, think of us as an online retailer of shoes, because that's how we started. But internally, we actually have a different uh, mentality. We have a saying that we're a service company that just happens to sell shoes. And in fact, we sell a lot more than shoes today. We sell clothing, beauty products, housewares, kitchenwares, and, and, and so on. And we're actually hoping 10 years from now, people won't even realize we started out selling shoes online. We really just want to build the Zappos brand to be about the very best customer service and customer experience. And in fact, it doesn't even have to be limited to online. We've actually had customers email us and ask us if we would please uh, start an airline or run the IRS. And you know, <laughs> we're not going to do either of those things uh, this year. Um, but 20 or 30 years from now, I wouldn't rule out a Zappos Airlines that's just about the very best customer service and customer experience. So one brand that we look to for inspiration sometimes is Virgin. They're in a whole bunch of different businesses, you know, music, airlines, and so on. The difference is the Virgin brand is more about being hip and cool, whereas we just want to be about the very best customer service. So our whole philosophy is let's take most of the money that we would have spent on paid advertising or paid marketing. And rather than buy our exposure, instead, let's invest it into customer service and the customer experience. 
and let our customers do the marketing for us through word of mouth. On any given day, about 75% of our orders are from repeat customers. And we basically grew from no sales in 1999 to in 2008 was the first year where we hit a billion dollars in gross merchandise sales. And actually, even despite the bad economy, we've actually continued to grow over the last two years. In fact, our net sales for Q1 this year were up almost 50% year over year. And people ask us, what did we do differently over the last 24 months? And it's actually, we actually didn't do anything differently. And it's not because of anything we did over the past two years. It's because of all the investment we made prior to that that we continue to grow because of the loyalty of our customers. And the number one driver of all that growth is through repeat customers and word of mouth. So these are some of the questions that we ask ourselves in terms of thinking about how to deliver great customer service. And we internally use the word wow when thinking about uh, how to treat customers. But we use it as a verb. We, we talk about how do we wow our customers and also how do we wow our employees and the vendors that we work with. And it starts with the policies you see on our website. We offer free shipping both ways. So a lot of people will order 10 different pairs of shoes, try them on in the comfort of their living room with 10 different outfits, and then send back the ones that don't fit or they don't like. And we encourage that type of behavior. Uh, we have a 365-day return policy for people that, I guess, have trouble committing or making up their minds. And uh, <laughs> you know, they can take a while to, uh, to return products. And you know, most websites, it's very hard to find contact information. Usually, it's buried five links deep. And, uh, maybe it's an email address. You can only email once. Whereas for us, we take the exact opposite approach. We put our 1-800 number on the top of every single page of our website because we actually want to talk to our customers. And it's funny because sometimes I'll be speaking at a branding or marketing conference and there's a lot of discussion about consumers being bombarded with thousands and thousands of marketing messages every day. How do you get your message to stand out? How do you get your brand to stand out? And you know, should they be investing millions of dollars in this 30-second uh, Super Bowl ad that people may or may not be paying attention to? Or should they be leveraging the latest in the social media fad? And for us, as kind of low-tech and unsexy as it may sound, we found that the telephone is actually one of the best branding devices out there, because we have the customer's undivided attention for five to 10 minutes. And if we get the interaction right, we find that the customers remember that for a very long time and tell their friends and family about us. And we run our call center very differently from most call centers. We don't have scripts. Uh, we don't have this concept of average handle time, which most call centers have, which is all about how quickly can you get the customer off the phone in the name of being more efficient. But we're not trying to maximize for efficiency. We're trying to maximize for the customer experience. And we don't upsell. And so going back to the no, no call time, I actually just got an email last night. A new record was set for the longest phone call ever. It was uh, eight hours and three minutes long. <laughs> so yeah. I don't know how the bathroom situation worked out for, for that one. But so and it may seem weird that you know, for us, we're an internet company. 95% of our sales go through the website. So why do we focus so much on the telephone? And what we found is actually, on average, almost every customer calls us at least once sometime during their lifetime. And it's actually usually not to place an order. Uh, most of our phone calls do not result in orders. It might be their first time going through the returns process, and they just need help stepping through the process of printing out the return label. Uh, for the first time. Or maybe they have a wedding over the weekend and they just want some fashion advice. And I think we have some customers that call us because they're lonely and we'll, um, <laughs> we'll talk to them as well. So, so that's our call center. And then for our warehouse, we actually run it very differently from most warehouses as well. Most warehouses, uh, they let the orders pile up so that when the picker needs to walk around, there's higher picking density, more efficient, doesn't need to walk as far. For us, we run our warehouse 24-7, which is not the most efficient way to run a warehouse. Uh, and, but we're not trying to maximize for efficiency. And because we run it 24-7, and because our warehouse is located in Kentucky, right next to the UPS hub, and because we do these surprise upgrades to overnight shipping for a lot of most of our repeat loyal customers, when you combine all three of those things, a lot of customers order as late as midnight Eastern time, and the shoes show up on their doorstep eight hours later when they're expecting it a week later. And that creates that whole emotional response we're trying to elicit in that wow experience that causes them to remember us for a very long time 
and tell their friends and family about us. So for all this focus on customer service and building our brand to be about customer service, customer service is actually not the number one priority of the company. Our number one priority is company culture. And our whole belief is that if you get the culture right, most of the other stuff, like delivering great customer service or building long, a long-term enduring brand, will just happen naturally on its own. And our belief is that a company's culture and a company's brand are really just two sides of the same coin. The brand is just a lagging indicator of the culture. And if you think of, you know, ask random people about what they think of the airline industry as a whole, and usually you'll get back responses about bad customer service or apathetic employees and so on. And like it or not, that is the brand of the industry, even though no airline set out for that to be their brand. So we really focus on getting the culture right. So what are some of the things that we do to really help build our culture? Well, it starts with the hiring process. Everyone that's hired in our headquarters in Las Vegas, doesn't matter what position, you mean accountant, lawyer, software developer, you go through the exact same training as our call center reps. One of the weeks is actually later on when we send you to Kentucky and you do all the different warehouse functions, picking, packing, shipping, receiving, and so on. But the first four weeks, before you start your actual job, we do call center training and we go over company history, the importance of company culture, our philosophy about customer service, and then you're actually on the phone for two weeks taking calls from customers. And the reason why we have everyone do that is because if we're serious about building our brand to be about the very best customer service and customer experience, then customer service shouldn't just be a department. It should be the entire company. And the other great thing about that is during our busy Q4 holiday season, which is uh, now coming up, people from all different departments can and do help out, and they hop on the phones and help answer the phone calls. So that means we don't need to hire temps that may be bad for our culture. We don't need to hire temps that may not deliver the same level of customer service that we're looking for. The other thing that we do is uh, at the end of the training, we actually make an offer to the entire class. And the offer is this. We will pay you, uh, actually it starts at the beginning of the end of the first week of training. They've been there for a week and the offer is, we will pay you for that week you've spent training plus a bonus of $2,000 to quit and leave the company right now. And that's a standing offer until the end of the training. And then we raise it to $3,000 and uh, extend it a couple months beyond that as well. And the reason we initially did this was because we didn't want employees that were there just for a paycheck. And starting pay in Las Vegas is $11 an hour. There's plenty of other uh, call centers there. And so it's a pretty significant amount of money. And on average, we found that actually about 2 or 3% of people end up taking the offer. The offer started several years ago at $100, and we actually keep upping the offer because we feel like not enough people are taking the offer. Um, <laughs> but what surprised us and what we didn't realize was that actually the biggest benefit came from the people who didn't take the offer because they still had to go home, talk to their friends and family, and ask themselves, is this a company that I really believe in? Is this a company that I want to be a part of and whose culture I want to contribute to? And when they decide to turn down the easy money, what we found is that when they're back in the office on Monday, they're that much more passionate and engaged and, and, uh, and really that by far that's been the biggest benefit for us that we didn't even expect in doing that. But before someone gets started at Zappos, before they go through the training, we actually interview everyone in two sets of separate interviews. Uh, the first set of interviews for someone is kind of the standard stuff. The hiring manager and his or her team will interview for fit within the team, relevant experience, technical ability, and so on. But the second set of interviews is done by our HR department looking purely for culture fit. And they have to pass both in order to be hired. So we've passed on a lot of really smart, talented people that we know can make an immediate impact on our top or bottom line. But if they're not good for our culture, we won't hire them. And the reverse is true, too. Uh, we'll fire someone if they're bad for our culture, even if they're doing their specific job function perfectly fine, even if they're a superstar in their job function. Uh, if they're bad for the culture, we'll fire them just for that reason. And our performance reviews are 50% based on whether you're living and inspiring the Zappos culture and others. The uh, other thing we have is something called a culture book. And I'll make that freely available, uh, give you information later on about that. But it's something we put out once a year. And we ask all of our employees to write a few paragraphs about what the Zappos culture means to them. 
And except for typos, it's unedited. So it includes the good and the bad, and it's organized by department. So you can kind of see how the accounting culture might be slightly different from the warehouse culture. So kind of like when you go to Amazon and you read customer reviews of products, these are essentially employee reviews of the company. We're also very active on Twitter. If you go to twitter.zappos.com, you can uh, see there's a page there. We have about 500 employees that are active on Twitter. We introduce every employee to Twitter during the training, and then it's up to them whether they want to continue using it. But then we have a page that aggregates all of the employee tweets together. And so the way that's helped our culture is you may not talk to that person that's three aisles down from you except for saying hi in the hallway. But through Twitter, you might find out that he went hiking over the weekend. And if you're also an avid hiker, now you have something to talk about, and you might go hiking together. So those are some of the things that we do on the company culture side. In terms of growing our brand over the next several years, we have what we internally refer to as the three C's, clothing, customer service, and company culture. And really, we think of this as in terms of the life cycle of the customer. So customers that have never heard of Zappos before have no idea what we do. We want them to know that we've got a great selection of clothing, footwear, and other product categories. Once they know about our selection, then we want them to know that we're all about delivering the very best customer service, which isn't something that we tell them so much as something that they experience when they get that, you know, see how easy that free shipping both ways is, or get that surprise upgrade to overnight shipping, or talk to one of our customer loyalty reps and see that the person on the other end truly wants to provide great service. And once they know that we're all about delivering the very best customer service, then we want them to know about our culture and core values, which is essentially a formalized definition of our culture, because that's really the platform that makes all of that possible. So we've actually had customers tell us that when they get that perfect outfit or perfect pair of shoes, that Zappos is happiness in a box. So whether it's the happiness that customers feel from getting that perfect outfit or a perfect pair of shoes, or the happiness that customers get, feel from experiencing great customer service, or the happiness that employees feel from being part of a culture where the personal values match their own, where their personal values match the corporate core values, the thing that we realize ties all of these things together is that Zappos is really just about delivering happiness, whether it's to customers, employees, and we apply that same philosophy to our vendors as well. So when you come in for a tour at Zappos uh, in our lobby area, the first thing you'll see is the Zappos library. And there's about 30 or 40 titles there. These are two of the titles that you'll see, except it's not a lending library. It's a giving library. And we give the books out freely to our employees as well as to visitors, because one of our core values is to pursue growth and learning. So at the end of the tour, a lot of visitors will take home three or four titles that they think are relevant to their business or their own personal life. And two of the books that are, some of the titles rotate in and out. Two of the books that are always there are uh, Good to Great and Tribal Leadership. And in fact, we even partnered with the authors of Tribal Leadership. You can download the audio version of the book for free from the Zappos website. And we, in fact, teach classes on each of these books to our employees. And the reason why these two books we really believe strongly in is because the authors researched and looked at what separated the great companies in terms of long-term financial performance from just the good ones. And they were actually surprised by their findings. It wasn't at all what they expected. They found that the great companies had two important ingredients that the good ones and mediocre ones generally did not have. And the first important ingredient was that the great companies all had strong cultures. And for us, we formalized the definition of our culture into 10 core values. And uh, we actually didn't always have core values at Zappos. We've been around for 11 years, and it wasn't until five or six years into it that we rolled out our core values, because it was kind of something that a bunch of us, myself personally, resisted, because it felt like one of those big corporate things to do. And you know, a lot of corporations have, they might call them core values or guiding principles or so on. But the problem is usually, they're very lofty sounding. They kind of read like a press release the marketing department put out. Uh, they sound just like their competitors. And maybe you learn about it on day one of your job, but then it becomes this meaningless plaque on the lobby wall. Well, we wanted to come up with committable core values. And by committable, meaning we're willing to hire or fire people based on those values, uh, completely independent of their actual job performance. And when you use that criteria, it's actually a really hard list to come up with. It took us a year to come up with it. And it wasn't just a few executives that spent a long weekend at an offsite somewhere and came up with the core values. But instead, I just emailed the entire company and asked our employees, what should our values be? Got a whole bunch of different responses back and went back and forth for about a year. And then he eventually came up with 
our list of 10 core values. So this is our list of 10 core values. And um, we actually have interview questions for each and every one of these core values. And, and actually, one of the cool things that I like about the list we ended up with is if you do a Google search for any one of these core values uh, by itself, in almost all the cases, Zappos is the number one search result. Whereas for take almost any other company, uh, do a search for one of their core values and page after page after page, you won't see that company name show up. So the one that actually probably trips us up the most during the hiring process is this last one, be humble, because there's a lot of really smart, talented people out there that are also egotistical. And you know, for us, it's not a question. We just won't hire them. Whereas the conversation at most other companies would be, well, this person might be kind of annoying and rub you the wrong way, but he's going to add a lot of value, and therefore, we should hire that person. And that one person may or may not bring the company culture downhill, but I think if you keep making compromises like that over and over and over again, that's why most large companies don't have great company cultures. But it's actually probably the one that's hardest to actually ask an actual interview question for, because you can't just say, how humble are you? And they say, I'm the most humble person in the whole wide world. <laughs> right? And so, um, but one of, what, one of the ways we test for this is um, a lot of our candidates actually are from out of town. And so we'll pick them up from the airport in the Zappos shuttle, give them a tour, and then they'll spend the entire day interviewing. Well, at the end of the day of interviews, the recruiter will circle back with the shuttle driver and ask how they were treated. And it doesn't matter how well the day of interviews went. If they didn't treat the shuttle driver well, then we won't hire them. It's not even a question. So I'll give some uh, examples of other uh, of interview questions we asked. Number three, create fun in a little weirdness. Uh, one of our interview questions is actually, on a scale one to 10, how weird are you? And you know, if you answer a one, you might be a little bit too straight-laced for the Zappos culture. If you answer a 10, you might be too psychotic for us. But it's actually not so much the actual number we care about. Our whole belief is that everyone's a little weird somehow. And this is really more just a fun way of saying that we really recognize and celebrate each person's individuality. And we want their true personality to come out and shine in the workplace. You know, there's so many people in corporate America where they're a different person at home on weekends versus when they show up into the office on Mondays. And they end up leaving a little part of themselves, or in a lot of cases, a big part of themselves at home. And that leads to discussions about work-life separation or work-life balance. And for us, actually, rather than worry about work-life separation, we really think about it in terms of work-life integration. We want the person to be the same person at home or in the office, because what we found is that's when the great ideas come out. That's when their creativity shines. And that's when true friendships are formed, not just coworker relationships. And that's really what, when people are in that environment, that's when the passion comes out. And that's really what's driven a lot of our growth over the years. And core value number four, uh, be adventurous, creative, and open-minded. So one of our interview questions here is on a scale one to 10, how lucky are you in life? One is, I don't know why bad things always seem to happen to me. And 10 is, I don't know why good things always seem to happen to me. Well, we don't want to hire the ones because they're bad luck. And we don't want bad luck to <laughs> come to Zappos. That, that wouldn't be good. Uh, no, but this was actually inspired by a research study that I read about several years earlier, where they actually asked that exact same question to a random group of people. And they got you know, some ones, some tens, a bunch of answers in between. And then afterwards, they had them do a task. And the task was to go through a newspaper and count the number of photos that were in that newspaper. But what the participants didn't know was that it was actually a fake newspaper. And sprinkled throughout the newspaper were these headlines that would say things like, if you're reading this now, you can stop. The answer is 37, uh, plus collect an extra $100. And what they found was that the people that considered themselves unlucky in life generally never noticed the headlines. They went through the task and you know, eventually came up with the right answer, whereas the people that consider themselves lucky in life generally stopped early and made the extra $100. So the takeaway is that it's not so much that people are inherently lucky or unlucky in life, but luck is really more about being open to opportunity beyond just how the task or situation presents itself. So that's why we asked that question for core value number four, be creative adventurous and uh, open-minded. 
Uh, and so one of our other core values is about being open and honest. Uh, it's really just all about transparency. And we really try to be as transparent as possible to our customers, to our employees, uh, to our vendors as well. So for our customers, for example, we hold a quarterly all hands meeting for our employees. And we actually live stream that on the internet so anyone can tune in and employees will ask questions about company financials or what brands we're going to carry and so on. The other thing we do is uh, when there's a reporter that wants to do a story on us, whether it's for TV or magazine or so on, uh, you know, most companies, most corporations, what would happen is they're escorted around by a PR person and the PR person says, you can talk to that VP over there and that person in communications over there. Everyone else is off limits. Don't talk to anyone else. Whereas what we do is we give a tour and at the end of the tour we say, bathroom's over there, lunchroom's over there, walk around, talk to whoever you feel like, and when you're done, come find me. And the reason we're comfortable doing that is because we know that employees understand the long-term vision of the company, and we know that employees we've hired, their personal values match the corporate values. So every employee is just automatically living the brand. And you know, they're not gonna, we don't do media training, and so when the reporter talks to 10 different employees, they're not gonna get the exact same phrases or sound bites and, and so on, but what they are gonna find is consistency in every employee's attitude, and more importantly, the authenticity in their interactions. And so that's why we, we're, we just tell anyone, just walk around and talk to whoever you, you want, because that's what we're comfortable with. Uh, with our employees, we have a monthly newsletter called Ask Anything, where it's literally that. Employees can ask about financials or uh, brands or whatever, and we'll find the best person to answer them and then put that all in the newsletter, and we send that out to in a, the entire company once a month. For our vendors, we work with 1,500 different brands, and they have access to this back-end system we call the extranet, where they can log in and view the exact same information our own buyers and merchandisers can view. So they can view on-hand inventory, sales, profitability, markdowns, and so on. And when we first rolled this out, the response from the vendor community was, wow, this is great, but aren't you worried this information is going to get into the hands of competitors? And Realistically, I'm sure some of the information does eventually find its way into the hands of competitors, but on the flip side, we now have an extra 1,500 pairs of eyes helping us co-manage our business, and they're not on our payroll. And so for us, we found that the benefits far outweigh any perceived risk, because a lot of times they'll catch stuff that our own buyers or merchandisers might miss if there's some style that's suddenly taking off, and you know, our buyers have portfolios of 20 to 30 brands, so they may not catch it in time. So, you know, this is a common reaction get, we get sometimes. Okay, happy for you, Zappos. You have this great culture. Made the Fortune 100 best companies to work for list. But the stuff you're talking about would never work at my company. Uh, and you know, when people come to our offices, they're like, oh, okay, I, I get it. But, you know, the way you're, you allow your employees to do X, Y, Z would never fly at my company. But what I found really interesting about the research from Good to Great and Tribal Leadership is that they found that it actually doesn't matter what your core values are. What matters is that you have them, and the power you get is out of the alignment that you get when you have the entire organization act in a certain way and have kind of a default uh, way of thinking. And, and, and that's what I found really interesting. And for us, what the real power came from when the values become integrated into our everyday language. And we don't even notice it, but not a day goes by where we don't use our core values just in our everyday conversation on a day-to-day -day basis. So it's really, that's the real power of having a strong culture, of having alignment throughout the entire organization. And I'm gonna make this presentation available because another reaction we get sometimes, and I wanted to include these other stories, is, oh, Zappos, you're an internet company, special rules apply to internet companies. And some of these stories in here are actually from companies in completely different industries and uh, completely different types of companies. And one of the other ways we're transparent is actually we have this separate uh, entity called Zappos Insights. It's actually its own website, zapposinsights.com, where we actually help other companies figure out how to build their own strong cultures and figure out their own core values. And there's a monthly video subscription service. There's also these one-day and two-day seminars where people and companies from all over the world actually fly in and uh, go through these exercises. And one of the stories I included in there is a company that went through about a year ago called the Atlanta Refrigeration Company. They're based in Atlanta, Georgia, and they do refrigeration repairs out in the field. So in some ways, you can't think of a more opposite company or industry than Zappos. And they went back, focused on company culture, focused on delivering better customer service, 
And now they're reporting back that their customers are happier, their employees are happier. They even sent us before and after pictures of their offices. And in a down economy, their revenues and profits are up. And so it's, for us, it's just been really interesting and rewarding to see this whole idea of happiness as a business model work in other industries and, and other companies. So going back to uh, good to great and tribal leadership, I said the authors researched and they found there were two important ingredients that separated the great companies in terms of long-term financial performance from just the good ones. The first ingredient was the great companies all had strong cultures. And the second one is actually really counterintuitive, uh, at least to me. And what they found was that the second important ingredient was that these great companies all had a vision that had a higher purpose beyond just money or profits or being number one in the market. And the weird thing and ironic thing about that is actually by having a higher purpose, it actually enabled these companies to generate more profits in the long run. And uh, sometimes I'll be speaking at an entrepreneur conference, for example, and I'll get approached afterwards where uh, entrepreneurs will ask, what's a good market to get into where I can make a lot of money? And my advice to them is, rather than have money be your primary motivator, instead, think about what would you be so passionate about doing that you'd be happy doing it for 10 years, even if you never made any money from it. And that's what you should be doing. And if you actually do that, it actually, in an ironic way, it greatly increases your chances of making more money in the long run because your passion is what's gonna get you through the tough times. Your passion is gonna rub off on your employees and your, uh, your su suppliers and the customers are gonna sense it. And it has this whole ripple domino effect. So I like to say chase the vision, not the money. Uh, there was a movie that came out uh, several years ago called Notorious. Um, I think it lasted a week in a theater, and I may have been the only person that saw this movie. Um, but in the movie, Puff Daddy uh, says to rapper Biggie Smalls, also known as Notorious B.I.G., don't chase the paper, chase the dream. I just want an excuse to put this picture up here <laughs> in a business talk. But. So, if you're an entrepreneur, you know, think about what would you be so passionate about doing that you'd be happy doing it for 10 years, even if you never made any money from it. And that's what you should be doing. And if you have employees that report to you, then think about what's the higher vision and greater purpose in their work beyond just money or profits or being number one in the market, because uh, that's what's actually going to help uh, inspire them. And you know, there's a lot of consultants and books that talk about how to motivate employees. And there always seems to be a new trend in, uh, in you know, the latest management fads. And you know, there's different ways to motivate employees. A lot of corporate America actually motivates employees through fear. Uh, you can also motivate employees through incentives. Uh, and you can motivate employees through recognition. And all of those things work up to a certain extent. But what we found at Zappos is there's a huge difference between motivation and inspiration. And if you can inspire your employees by having a higher purpose in the company beyond just money or profits or being number one in the market, and if you can inspire employees by having corporate core values that match their own personal values, and not just the stated core values, but the actual practice core values, then you can accomplish so much more. And you don't really need to worry about the motivation part of it. The inspiration uh, just will, ex will accomplish much, much more than the motivation part of it. So this is the um, evolution of our brand at Zappos. In 1999, it was just, OK, let's just, our vision was, let's just sell a lot of shoes. It's all going to be about selection. And then four years into it, in 2003, we all sat around and asked ourselves, what do we want to be when we grow up? Do we want to be about shoes, or do we want to be about something more meaningful. And that's when we decided, OK, let's build the Zappos brand to be about the very best customer service and customer experience. And a funny thing happened when we communicated this to our employees. We found that suddenly employees were a lot more passionate and excited about the company. And when customers called, they could sense the person on the other end of the line truly wanted to provide great service and wasn't there just for a paycheck. And we found that when vendors came and visited us, they wanted to visit us more often and stay longer. And so all these things had this kind of multiplicative snowball effect that drove a lot of our growth over the years. And then 2005 was when we switched from culture just being important to culture being the number one priority in the company with the belief that if we get the culture right, 
then most of the other stuff, delivering great customer service, building a long-term enduring brand, that'll just take care of itself. And then 2007, we started thinking about, OK, what are different ways we can provide great customer service? Some companies focus more on the technology and efficiency part of it. Well, we decided instead of going the high-tech approach to go the high-touch approach and really focus on building personal emotional connections. And then 2009, we took a step back and realized, OK, customer service is about making customers happy. Uh, company culture is about making employees happy. Let's just tie it all together and really have our vision be about delivering happiness to the world. And then from that expanding vision, that's what led to the development of ZapposInsights.com, which is a completely different business. It doesn't have anything to do with uh, e-commerce or selling shoes online. So I wanted to tell another pizza story. And uh, this actually happened a few years ago in Santa Monica, California. And I was actually at a Skechers conference. And uh, it's one of the brands we work with, one of the footwear brands. And it was a long day. And at the end of the day, a bunch of us decided to go bar hopping. There were three people from Skechers and three people from Zappos, including myself. I'd never been bar hopping in the Santa Monica area before. So we went to the first bar. And someone ordered a round of drinks. And then someone, I can't remember who, decided to order a round of shots. So it been a long day. We took the shots, finished the round of drinks. And then we went to the second bar. And someone else ordered a round of drinks to pay back for that first round of drinks. And someone else ordered a second round of shots to pay back for that first round of shots. And we're looking at it, and we determined that you can't waste alcohol. So we <laughs> took the shots and finished the drinks. And then went to the third bar. And I'm actually unclear how many shots or drinks we had after that. But what I do know is that in California, last call is, I think it's 2 a.m. Is it 2 a.m.? OK. I, I'm from Vegas, so last call isn't in the dictionary there. But um, <laughs> so it's 2 a.m. And uh, anyway, so finally, lights go on. I don't know how many bars we've been to. And finally, start walking back to the hotel room. And as we're walking back to the hotel room, one of the girls from Skechers asked if we wanted to all share a pepperoni pizza. And she was so excited. And we're like, yeah, sure. And she's like, oh, I'm so excited. I actually checked it out on the room service menu before we left. It was on page 17, item number two. And I know when it comes, it's going to be super hot. And I don't want to burn the roof of my mouth. So I'm just going to blow on it and let the aroma slowly waft into my nose. And she kept talking about it and kept super excited. And it was only a five minute walk, but it seemed much longer than that because she would not stop talking about this pepperoni pizza. So anyways, we finally wind up in someone's hotel room. She's super excited, calls room service, and then 10 seconds later, hangs up the phone all dejected. And I ask her, what's wrong? And she said, apparently, this hotel doesn't deliver hot food after 11 PM. And she was like, oh, you have no idea how much I was craving that pepperoni pizza. And I was like, I think we all have a pretty good idea of how <laughs> you're craving. And, but she was still really sad, and I'm trying to think about, OK, how do you cheer up? And then I tell her the story of like how in college, I used to make pizza, and this guy named Malford, and, and this is how we met. And at the end of my story, she looks at me, and she's like, that's so not helpful right now. <laughs> and so you know, Fred, who's also from Zappos, he and I are kind of brainstorming. And then we come up with the best idea ever. We say, oh, call Zappos, call Zappos. We're all about the best customer service. We'll take care of you. And really, in our inebriated state of mind, we thought that was the funniest thing ever. And so, so she actually takes us up on our dare and uh, you know, puts it on speakerphone and uh, you know, says, rep answers, thanks for calling Zappos. How can I help you? And the rest of us are in the background trying to like, be quiet and not, not laugh. And, and she's like, oh, thank goodness you're answered. I know it's 3 AM, but I'm in Santa Monica right now in this hotel that doesn't serve hot food after 11 PM. Been craving this pepperoni pizza on the room service menu. I'm looking at it right now, page 17, item number two. You're like, Is there anything you can do for me? Well, first, there was an awkward silence. And then, <laughs> and then the rep said, you know you called Zappos, right? Um, <laughs> we sell shoes. We sell clothes. Uh, but we don't sell pizza yet. And she's like, I know, but I heard you're all about the best customer service. And the rep said, OK, hold on. And put us on hold for two minutes, and then came back listing the five closest places in the Santa Monica area that were still open and delivering pizza at that hour. Now, well, first of all, I, 
I hesitate a little to tell the story because I don't want all of you to start calling Zappos and <laughs> ordering pizza from us. But you know, clearly we don't have a process and procedure for late night drunk pizza orders. But uh, you know, it just goes back to, I just think it's a fun story to illustrate that if you get the culture right, then most of the other stuff like delivering great customer service and building your brand one story at a time, one phone call at a time, just happens naturally on its own. And you know, these types of stories we are creating at Zappos literally thousands and thousands of times every single day. And that's how we've built our brand over the years. And these are you know, questions that we think about. How do we create more happy memories for our customers? And how do we elicit more positive emotions? And really, we're in the memories and emotions business and stories business. And then we also think about how do we keep thinking differently and expanding what business we're actually in? How do we think bigger and think differently? And one of my favorite stories is about Cirque du Soleil, where you know, they completely redefine the circus business. Prior to uh, Cirque du Soleil, to have a better circus meant more elephants, bigger elephants. And the market research surveys, if they did them, would be exiting, you know, doing exit polls. And they'd be like, were the elephants uh, of sufficient quantity and of sufficient size? And, uh, you know, and then th that would tell them how to build a better circus. And then Cirque du Soleil just thought completely you know, outside the box. So anyways, just wanted to um, wrap up and actually take a step back from all of this business talk and have you guys actually think about this for yourselves. Uh, what is your goal in life? And like, think for yourself personally, what is your actual goal in life? And when I ask different people this question, I actually get a whole bunch of different answers back. Uh, some people will say they want to, say, grow a company, especially at entrepreneur uh, conferences. Some people say they want to be healthy. And then I'll ask them why. So whatever your goal in life is, ask yourself why. And then people come up with another set of answers. They want to retire early or uh, run faster. And then I'll ask them why again. And so whatever your answer is, just ask yourself why. And what's interesting is if you ask why enough times, almost everyone comes up with the same answer. And it's be they're pursuing their goal in life because they believe it will ultimately make them happier. So I started a few years ago reading about this whole field of research called the science of happiness. Uh, the official name is actually positive psychology, but it's based on actual research that's been done. Not, so I'm not say, talking about go to the you know, self-help section of a bookstore and think positive and you'll be happy, but actual research that's been done. And as I was reading about this, prior to 1998, most of psychology was about how do you take people that had something wrong with them and make them more normal? But almost nobody bothered to study how to take normal people and make them happier. So, as I was reading about this, one of the consistent findings from the research was that people are actually very bad at predicting what will make them happy on a sustainable, sustainable basis. Most, pe most people think, oh, once I get X, then I'll be happy. Once I achieve X, then I'll be happy. When the research shows, you know, for example, lottery winners, look at their happiness right before winning the lottery, and then a year later, and a year later it's the same or maybe a little bit lower than before. So people are bad at predicting what will make them happy. And then, you know, started thinking about, well, you know, at Zappos, there's a science behind a lot of the stuff that we do in terms of website conversion, customer acquisition metrics, repeat customer behavior. And if the ultimate goal is happiness, what if some percent of time was actually spent just reading up on the research that's been done? How can that not only help personally, but how can it help the company in terms of making customers happy and making employees happy? Because it's not as simple as just asking customers or employees what would make you happy. You know, a lot of people go through life trying to get to that ultimate destination of happiness. But a lot of people never get there. And of the people that do get there, a lot of, most of them find that it's actually very short-lived, not quite what they were uh, expecting. What if by reading up on the science happiness, learning a little bit about the research, you can kind of shortcut some of it and go to the happiness much faster? So I just wanted to share some of the frameworks of happiness that I thought were most interesting from the research that I read. First. Uh, framework is happiness is really just about four things. Perceived control, perceived progress, connectedness, meaning the number and depth of your relationships, and being part of something bigger than yourself. And what's interesting is you can apply this to business as well. You know, connectedness goes back to company culture. And I'll give a quick example for uh, perceived progress. We used to hire people in our merchandising department at entry level and then give them promotions every 18 months you know, they get trained and certified and so on, and then in three years, they become a buyer. Well, we changed that a few years ago so that instead of a promotion every 18 months, 
we gave them smaller promotions every six months. Nothing changed. They still took three years to become a buyer. They still had to go get certified and so on. But we found employees were much happier because there was that ongoing sense of perceived progress. And it cost the company nothing to do that. Uh, Maslow's hierarchy, there's a book called Peak by Chip Conley, P-E-A-K, where he condenses it down to three levels. And so, for example, for employees, it's do they think of their work as a job or career or calling? And our whole goal at Zappos is to move them up that pyramid so that they're still employees at Zappos 10 years from now. And then the last framework I wanted to share real quickly are the three types of uh, happiness, pleasure, engagement, and meaning. And the first type I like to call the rock star type of happiness because it's all about chasing that next high. And it's great if you can sustain it. The problem is it's very hard to sustain unless you're basically a rock star. And what the research has shown is that as soon as the source of stimuli goes away, that's giving you that high, uh, as soon as that goes away, your happiness just plummets and drops right back down to wherever it was before. It's the shortest last, lasting type of happiness. The second is called flow, and it's about, uh, we've all experienced this, it's about those moments when time just flies because you're so into whatever you're doing. For some people it's running, for other people it might be painting, and it's three hours past, seems like only 20 minutes have passed, and professional athletes refer to it as being in the zone where peak engagement meets peak performance. And other characteristics associated with it are you lose a sense of self-consciousness self -consciousness or even self. And basically, uh, the strategy there is notice when it happens and then change your environment, your friends, where you live, your job, and or so on, to have it happen more often. And the research shows that that's the second longest lasting type of happiness. And the third type is the longest lasting type. It's about being part of something bigger than yourself. And for some people, it might be volunteering for your favorite charity, for example. And what I found interesting is most people go through life chasing after the first type of happiness, thinking once I can sustain that on an ongoing basis, which is next to impossible, then I'll worry about the second type. And then if I ever get around to it, then I'll worry about the third type. When, based on the research data, and purely on the research data, the proper strategy is figure out the third type first, layer on top of that the second type, and then any time you experience the first type, it's just icing on the cake. So some books I would recommend uh, for a copy of this presentation, email Tony at deliveringhappinessbook.com. Uh, make sure to include the book at the end in the URL uh, or the email address. And for a culture book that I talked about, uh, make sure to include your f mailing address because it's a physical book and uh, we'll send it to you. Next time you're in Vegas, go to tours.zappos.com to get a free tour. We'll pick you up. And you know the subtitle of my book, is the title of my book is Delivering Happiness. The subtitle is A Path to Profits, Passion, and Purpose. And you need all three in order to have a business that will continue to grow. And companies, you know, so many companies in corporate America focus on just the profits part of it and forget about the passion and purpose. And that actually ends up hurting their ability to generate profits in the long term. And then I had this weird aha moment where happiness, you know, is really about being able to combine pleasure, passion, and purpose. And so, you know, this whole idea of happiness as a business model is something that, through the book, we want to spread to other organizations and other companies. And I think we're just at the beginning of a very special time where we're all hyper-connected, information travels so quickly, companies' culture, companies' brand, are, that lag time is becoming less and less. And really, that's how we've approached things at Zappos. And uh, you know, just want to leave you with thinking about what percent of your time do you want to spend reading up on the science of happiness, and how can that help yourself personally your brand or your business. And the research shows that companies that have a higher purpose actually generate more profits in the long term. And people that have a higher purpose actually are happier. You know, think about what is your company's higher purpose and what is your own higher purpose? And if through this presentation you've been inspired to make customers happier through customer service or make employees happier by focusing more on culture and, and figuring out the vision, or just make yourself happier by reading up more on this whole science of happiness. If any of those things have happened, then I'll have done my part in helping us fulfill our own higher purpose, which is all about delivering happiness to the world. Thank you very much. <laughs>